Greetings, this is Assistant Pastor Earl Carter, and welcome to Fellowship in the Word. Uh, today I'd like to talk with you a little bit about commitment. Uh, today, in, in, across our country, we, we've seen a number of elected officials and they are committed to that process. They have been committed to get into office. And unfortunately, there are some that have been so committed to get into a seat of power that they would even compromise the strength of the position that they're going to hold or they hope to hold. There have been some politicians that have been so committed to get into a seat of power or into the Congress that they fabricated their life they fabricated their financial picture. They've even fabricated experiences that their family allegedly had gone through. So commitment is important in life today, uh, especially in the family structure. You have a husband committed to one wife and one wife committed to one husband. But today I wanna to talk about commitment pertaining to a church. And, and, and this is a cultural thing as well within churches, and it is needed. Go with me to the book of Revelation and open up to chapter number three, and we're going to read a couple of verses and, and look at this commitment and consider this one particular church. Revelation chapter three, and we'll start at verse number seven. And I'm so thankful that that in the church that I attend, the Believers Worship Center, we're taught the scriptures and, you know, we, we, we read and understand and we want to move forward and things of that nature. And what we're going to look at is a, is a cultural thing as well. And I believe that exists in our church. However, in some churches it doesn't. But the scriptures read, starting at verse number seven, and we'll read just verses seven and eight. The scripture says, unto the angel, of the church in Philadelphia right. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. And so there, Jesus is speaking to this church, and, and he is bringing out a couple of points about this particular church. One of those is that he says, you have kept my word, and then later he would say, you have not denied my name. So right away we see here that this church is committed to the word of God. This church is committed to the name of Jesus. And, and that is so important today when forming alliances and loyalties, one must go ahead and commit to the Lord Jesus or you're not committed to the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'll have you hot or cold, one or the other. If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You know, the scriptures tells us that we can't serve two masters. So either we're serving the Lord Jesus or we're serving Satan, the devil. But the scripture says here, this church was committed to keep the word of God. They were committed to keep his name. However, before one can keep something, before it can be kept in your possession, you must receive it. Turn with me to two scriptures. Turn to Luke chapter eight and put your finger there. We're gonna pick up at verse 15. But turn to Mark's gospel, chapter four, and we're gonna look at verse number 20. And this is the parable of the sower. And this will give us some insight into this church concerning their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. This tells us how an individual views the word of God. It tells us how committed they are to the word of God when we read through the scriptures. Mark's gospel, chapter four, verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it. There's a key, an operative word, receive it. They receive it. 
They take it in. They accept the word of God. And then it says, and they bring forth much fruit. And, and, and so in order for you to keep the word of God, you must receive the word of God. And this has to be in one's thinking to receive that which is given to you. This means to accept or to adhere to something. This means to yield to that train of thought when it says that they received it, they accepted it. Now look at, I, I love this one in Luke's gospel chapter 8. The scripture says, verse 15, and, and please note, we're looking at only the soil that was good soil. Okay? We're not looking at those that were sown by the wayside and those that were sown among thorns. We're just looking at those that were sown on good ground, good soil. Why? Because when we read through Revelation chapter 3 and we start at verses 7 and 8 and we continue to read about the church of Philadelphia, there was no negative given to them from the Lord Jesus Christ. It was all positive. Even though we get to a point where it says that you have a little strength, that's okay. Jesus is going to take care of that too. But understand this. The scriptures tell something about the church at Philadelphia based on our understanding of how one receives the word of God. Verse 15 reads, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart Woo, an honest and good heart. Now that gives us a peep into the culture of the Philadelphian church. They were honest individuals. They had a good heart, meaning the word of God was, was there to go into the heart and their heart was open to receive the scriptures. And we, we, we may look at the Berean church in Acts 17, how it talks about they with readiness of heart. This gives us insight into this church and it was the entire church. Thank God for unity. Thank God that this church was in one accord, that they all had a good and an honest heart. Now, it didn't say they were out without sin, because we know all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but they had an honest heart. When the word of God would go forth, they were open to receive it, and they were honest with the word when it came to bring reproof as which the word of God does. It, it is designed to bring reproof, to bring correction. They were honest in their heart to receive the truth, to receive correction when there was error. And this is what God is designed for all churches. Not big churches only, not little churches, medium churches, but the entire body of Christ is to receive the word of God, to receive the instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be perfected, they may be mature. And, and totally equipped with the word of God, with the understanding and knowledge of the kingdom of God, that they may bring forth fruits of righteousness. Look at the rest of this. It gives us insight into the church of Philadelphia and, and why they were so committed. The scriptures goes on to say that they were honest and good heart, or they which they received the word in an honest and good heart. Having heard the word, they keep it and bring forth fruit of patience. They keep it. That word keep means to now that you have received something, it means to retain it. It means to possess it. It means to keep this thing with you. It, it means that, that this possession that you have is maintained with you. So in order to keep something or something that's kept, we see here that one must receive the word of God. Amen? Uh, this commitment to the word of God, let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 and talk about this commitment to the word of God. Why were they so committed? Because there are some things concerning the word of God. And, and since this church was on point with what God had commissioned that church to do, they understood the power that's in the word of God. And this is one reason why this was so committed. They understood the power that is in the word of God. The scriptures tells us that God's word will produce God's word will cause things to advance. In Isaiah 55, around verse number 11, the scriptures tells us that God sent his word forth 
and it will not return to him void. This was an understanding in this church, in their mentality. This was a cultural thing in this church. They understood that God's word had so much power. God's word is so alive, according to Hebrews chapter 4. The scripture says the word of God is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There it is, that heart thing. The word of God is full of power. And so Isaiah said, when God's word goes forth, it is going to return to him, fully accomplishing what it was set out to do. And one thing I will say is that the word of God was set out to save men. And there are multitudes that have come to Jesus. Even on the day of Pentecost, many came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the word of God is so full of power. This word that the church of Philadelphia had so committed to, to bring forth fruits of righteousness. The scriptures tells us this also, and I love this one. This is a scripture I often use and when, when counseling with couples that Jesus said this in John's gospel chapter 6, I believe it's six, verse 63. He said, the words that I speak, the words that I speak. Here we go now, the power of the word, commitment to the word of God. The words that I speak are spirit and life. And in a marital relationship, the words that are being spoken should always be words that are inspired from the spirit of God. They should always be words that are life-giving in any situation, even when it is correction. The, the Bible tells us that God's words is, is life and light, and the scriptures tells us that God whom he loves, he chastises. Well, some would think that chastisement is a hard thing or it's a bad thing, but it is a good thing. Why? Because it demonstrates his love. For whom the Lord loves, he chastises, he corrects. And so we see here that the church at Philadelphia had this understanding because they received the word Jesus testified of them. Can you imagine Jesus testified of you? What is he going to say to the Father? Well, Jesus put it this way. He said, if you choose your words, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. How about that of Jesus' testimony for you? And this was his testimony concerning the, the, the church at Philadelphia. He, he said that they have kept his word. Jesus' words are true. In fact, if you go back to verse number seven, it characterizes, or shall I say, he, Jesus, characterizes himself. Look at, look at, it, at verse number seven. Let's just go back. There. I just love this. He said, unto the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, saith he, mm, that is holy, and what? That is true. So Jesus is testifying about this church that he has observed their comings and goings and even their works is true. And so when Jesus says they kept the word, it's true. They kept the word. They had a high regard for the word of God. There was a premium on the word of God in their mindset, in the culture of this church, that, that when the doors came open to the church, that church was there, full in attention to hear the word of God, to know the word of God, and to allow the word of God to be that lamp unto their feet and a light to their path, even in dark times or even in persecuting times. Now, this church did go through persecution just like all the churches did. I believe these seven churches existed simultaneously around and the persecution that one received one received it the other received it as well maybe not to the same extent but there was still persecution even then at the writing of this John was persecuted in fact John wrote this while he was in exile in prison on the island of Patmos but now we see here the word of God and we see again the commitment of the Philadelphian church that they were committed to the word of God because they recognized that the word of God had power. If you go to John's gospel, chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And this is another reason why there was a commitment to the word of God. 
because the Philadelphian church would learn about Jesus. And so when we look at John's gospel, chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He said, search the scriptures for they testify of me. And this is a reason why the church at Philadelphia was so committed because they knew they could go to the word of God and learn about Jesus. They could understand more about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the things that he's done in their life to cause them to advance and we'll see that in a moment. Further, their commitment to the scriptures. They understood that the word of God cleansed. In John's gospel chapter 15 verse number 13 Jesus said to the disciples as he was ministering to them and he was preparing himself to go to the cross he said now you are made clean by the words that I speak. Cleansliness. The word of God cleanses us. You know, in Ephesians, it says that Jesus Christ is going to present the church to himself holy and without a blemish and that he washes the church by the water of the word. It cleanses. And so the church of Philadelphia, because Jesus did not rebuke them, they understood that they had to adhere to the word of God to receive it, that the word of God would cleanse their minds and cleanse their hearts and cleanse them that this would be a holy church for God said in the word, be ye holy as I am holy. And I believe that the church at Philadelphia received this instruction and they were so committed to the word of God because they understood the power of the word of God in their life. And it was so important for them to be committed to that. One more scripture, John's gospel, chapter 17, and I believe it's verse 17 where Jesus said, now you are sanctified by God's truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. And so God's word would sanctify or set you apart. And the church of Philadelphia was set apart to do a work for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why he said and he told them, he said, I, I know your works. I know your works. And, and, and that's going to be important as far as your commitment. They were so committed to the word of God. And in fact, I, I do want to look at the Berean church. Go with me to Acts chapter 17. This is one of my favorite places in the Bible because it shows a church that was ready for the word of God. They were hungry for the word of God and they, they wanted to take the word of God and allow it to be a part of their being. In fact, accepting that word means to, to accept it and to receive it. Let's see, Acts chapter 17, verse number... 17. Now verse number 10, the scriptures reads, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming hither went into the synagogue of the Jews. And now listen to this commentary on this church, the Bereans. It says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word. All right, remember that word, receive? The same term, the same word that's used concerning the church at Philadelphia. They received that word in order to keep that word. But look at how they received it, the scripture says. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Two points here. It, it said that they searched the scriptures they searched the scriptures. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees in John 5. He said, go search the scriptures for they speak about me. And so now the Berean church, they are searching the scriptures. They're looking for that word. And, and we're going to see some other scriptures that talks about over in Proverbs, my son, attend to my words. This is what it means here to search the scriptures and to look them out and to seek them out to understand. And when he talks about attending to the word in Proverbs 40, this is what it means that the Bereans were doing. They were attending to the word. That means they were taking heed to that word. They were hearkening to that word. And one place I was looking at the definition of, of, of taking heed to that word and attending to the word is it, it means to prick your ears up. And so right away it gave me a picture of a dog, a watchdog a guard dog on duty, a, a big German shepherd or a big Doberman pitcher, and they, they're, they're just sitting there and they hear a crack, they hear a sound, and all of a sudden their head goes up and their ears do what? 
They stand straight up. Well, this was the posture of the listening of the Berean church. And I believe this was the posture and the culture of the church at Philadelphia. Their ears were up to receive what the word of God was going to speak to their hearts. This word that, that Jesus spoke, that gave to John and said, give this to the angel of the church. Give this to that, that head leader of that church. I believe when he says the angel, I believe that this was a pastor over this church that was to receive this message and they were to take that message and they were to communicate this message to the church and the whole church would gather together in Philadelphia and they all had their ears up ready to be pricked ready to receive ready to take the word of God and engraft it into their heart that they might not sin against the Lord and so this is a picture here or this is how we look at the commitment to the word of God. So I would ask you out there that's listening, how committed are you to the scriptures? Are you willing to do as Jesus said, search those scriptures. Go see if what you are hearing is actually written in the scriptures and then begin to study the scriptures to show yourself approved so that you can be a workman fully equipped with the understanding of the word of God, with a proper understanding of the power of the word of God, then understand the power that's in the name of Jesus. This is where that church was. You know, the, the scriptures tells us to hide that word and to incline that ear. And, and the psalmist tells us in Psalm 119, and the scripture says around verse number 11, the psalmist said this. He said, thy word, the scriptures, thy word have I hid in my heart. That is, I have treasured this thing. This is of value to me. I am putting that to my very core. When the scriptures talks about the heart of a man, it's talking about your spirit. It's talking about the very essence of who you are. The part of you that we cannot see physically, but it's that part of you that God deals with your spirit, your heart. And he said, I'm going to put that word in my heart. Why? Because the scripture says, Solomon, he said, my son, attend to my words. Keep them in the midst of your heart, he says. Keep them in the midst of your heart because out of your heart will flow the issues of life. And in order for the issues of life to flow out, the issues of life are going to be pertaining to the word of God. This is where God measures your faithfulness. This is where God measures your commitment to the word of God. Are you willing to persevere through? Are you willing to go through the hardships as a good soldier of the gospel of Jesus Christ when God is requiring you to press toward that mark for the prize of the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus and that high calling of God is to execute righteousness in the earth and to allow the word of God to be that lamp unto your feet to dictate the pace of life and, and when you make a mistake or when you are an arrow when you sin again the word of God will dictate the pace of your life because conviction will come to repent in the name of Jesus Christ and allow the word of God to wash you from all unrighteousness. And so I see here and, I, and I'm talking to you about your commitment because this church here in Philadelphia was committed to the word of God to receive the word of God and to hear the word of God. Let's go back to the book of Revelation chapter 3. The book of Revelation chapter 3. And then Jesus starts off I know your works. I love that because that tells us that he's involved. Okay, I, I know that which you are involved with. I know what you are producing. Jesus is aware of what this church is doing. And, and he says, I know your efforts and I know your deeds. Mm. I know your works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. I love this because he says, I know your works. And because I know your works of righteousness, because I know your works of faith. James said this. James said, show me, show me, show me your works. And he said, and I will show you my faith 
by my works. That is, my works will show you that I have faith because of my activity. And when Jesus says, I know your works, he said, I know your faith, Philadelphia. I know your faith. I know you're trusting and believe me. In fact, I understand these things Jesus is saying. Wow. He says, I know your works. So I have set an open door before you. Why? Because I'm trusting you with your works to go through that open door to produce more works. And I would say this to every believer. I would say this in churches of all sizes that you have campaigns that you are moving forward in and that you desire to bring to pass. And it may not have come to pass at this juncture, but understand Jesus has to open that door. And when he does open that door, then it's time to move. Hallelujah. Understand that he knows the work that is being performed in your church. The works of salvation, the name of Jesus that produces. And, and this is what I want to move to and, and understand and speak to concerning committed to the name of Jesus. Not only were they committed to the word, but they were committed to the name of Jesus. Jesus said, you have kept my name. And because I have put an open door there, you can walk through that door and bring forth the mysteries of Christ. Walk through that door because in my name there is power to deliver. It's in my name that there is deliverance. When we read through Acts chapter 2 and Acts 4, when they got saved, Peter would testify and say, listen, this man, first of all, that was made whole in, in Acts chapter 2, this lame man that leaped up and walked around that everyone saw sitting at the gate called beautiful there was power in the name of Jesus he said it is in the name of Jesus that this man was made whole and so the commitment to the word of God and then there's the commitment to the power that's in the name of Jesus that made this man whole we see it's a cultural thing in the church of Philadelphia because in their works there was a commitment to the name of Jesus why because they know they knew just like every believer must understand, we can do nothing unless Christ strengthens us. And it's because of the power that's in the name of Jesus to bring about deliverance. This is what they had, power to believe. The scriptures tells us that Jesus said, in my name, You'll cast out demons. Oh, I'm praying for the manifestation right now. Oh, God, work through your church. Work through your body. Give your men, your women of God, give your people, God, a holy boldness, God, to see that spirit, to see an unclean spirit, to discern its presence, and to call it out in the name of Jesus and, and see people delivered from demonic oppression and, and see them delivered from demonic possession in the name of Jesus. He said, you will cast out demons. You will cast them out in my name. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 8, and we'll look at verse number 12. And this is the situation Philip is down in Samaria. And it says, but when they believed Philip, Philip was preaching the word of God, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. There's power to believe, power in the name of Jesus to believe what the scripture says. And this was a part of the culture and the mindset in the church of Philadelphia that they believed in the power of the name of Jesus. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus said, if you ask anything in his name, he said, I will pray to the Father and the Father may be glorified and this will take place and I will give it, I will do it. Ask, there's power in the name of Jesus. In fact, it's because of the name of Jesus and what he did that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain grace and mercy to help in a time of need. It's because of what Jesus did. The power of the name of Jesus and what he has done on Calvary It's because we can come not in our own righteousness for it's as filthy rags, but it is the righteousness, the power of Jesus, the power of his name name, the power in what he has done that causes us to have access into the holy of holy in before God to make our requests known unto him. And Father, we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3. Going back to the fact that he said, I know your works. 
Our works are based on the word of God. We do what God tells us to do. And there is an attitude, there is a mindset in how we do it. And because our works is what we do, and it is to be done that God would be glorified in the end. Colossians 3, verse number 17, it says this. And whatsoever you do, this is your works. Whatever, whatever you do in word and deed, do all what? In the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now veil to verse number 23. It says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Doing it as unto the Lord, doing it in the name of Jesus, there's power in that. And when we look at the Holy Scriptures, we can see how that is reflected in the church of Philadelphia because they did everything to God's glory. Jesus said, your works, if their works were not done unto God and for his glory, Jesus would have rebuked them. But he said, I know your works, meaning I looked at the inside, I looked at the outside, I looked at the height of your work, I looked at the depth of your work, and I, I, it's pleasing to me, and therefore I'm going to put that door, an open door that no man can shut, I'm going to put it before you. And so now we see it in, book, in the book of Revelation where the church of Philadelphia had just a little strength. But go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and we'll look at Paul and, and understand this. The scripture says this. When Paul had this, this, this infirmity, when he had this, this weakness going on, in verse 9 it says, or verse number eight, it says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that what? The power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, Paul is saying, I am weak, but I give glory to God in this weakness because I've come to the end of what I can do, and now it's going to be the power of God that's going to manifest itself in my life from that point therefore. And so we see here the power of Christ. When Jesus said first of all to the church of Philadelphia he says you have a little strength and, and, and that's a good thing because they maybe they were a small church in number like some churches today. He, he said you have a little strength and it's good to have a little strength versus no strength. But he said, because you have a little strength, I'm going to keep this door open until you get to the place where as you walk through it, you will be strengthened to do greater works than what you're doing. But I want you to understand, because that door is opened by me, remember Jesus said, I'm going to open this door that no man can shut. That means ministry is empowered by Jesus. He controls it all. And so don't worry. Don't worry. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said, and believe that it is the power in the name of Jesus that will cause your church, your ministry, your life to move forward. My time has run out. This has been Assistant Pastor Earl Carter sharing with you the fellowship in the word. And until we meet again, may the Lord bless your heart with the understanding of his will for your life. God bless you. And have a great day in the Lord Jesus Christ. We appreciate your continued support. If you would like to make a donation or pay your tithes and offering, please go to tbwc.org slash give. We have begun our Moving People in the Right Direction pledge campaign and $12 is all it takes to help us to purchase and complete the construction of our building. Your donation can be made at tbwc.org. Join us every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. online or on Facebook. It is our pleasure to introduce our new online Christian education program, The Believer's Bible Institute. Registration is now open for individuals interested in furthering their knowledge of the Word of God. Please visit bbitbwc.com for more information and to view our current course offerings. Jesus said, Come unto me. Join us for prayer every Friday at 7 p.m. You can submit a prayer request 
by emailing us at prayer at tbwc.org.